SRPC live stream. Thanks for worshiping with us today. When I was a kid, I played a game, and you probably played something like this as well. The game went like this. If you could go back in time, any time in history, and meet up with just one person, who would it be, and what would you ask them? In a sense, we've been playing that game this summer with Old Testament characters in the Bible, but instead of asking them questions, we've invited them to speak to us, because the lives and the stories of Old Testament characters in the Bible are rich and wonderful. They have a lot to say to our lives today. They're extremely relevant, and we want to make the most of those opportunities to meet up with those characters. Well, last week, we met up with a woman named Esther in the Bible, and this week, we're going to finish her story. I want to catch you up with Esther's story and, and then move it forward to the rest of the book. But Esther, if you were with us last week, you may remember it's a very unique book because it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God. (laughs) You sort of wonder how it made the cut, right? But Esther's filled with uh, interesting, intriguing characters. There's heroes and there's villains. There's winners. There's losers. There's four main characters in Esther. There's Esther, who's the queen, and then there is her cousin Mordecai. Now, Mordecai, he is a cousin, but sort of functions a little bit as a older brother or father figure for Esther. Then there's a guy named Haman. He's the villain of the story. And finally, there's the king. And the king spends actually most of the book of Esther drunk and pretty clueless. So he's not really much good, except he makes big, big decisions, as we'll see in just a few minutes. Now, Esther wasn't always the queen. In fact, she became queen when the former queen was deposed. Esther was actually a Jewish girl that grew up in the Persian Empire, and she became queen by winning this sort of weird beauty pageant that looked a lot like the ancient version of The Bachelor. She and a bunch of other women got to spend one night with the king, and then he got to pick his new queen based on who he liked the best. You thought The Bachelor was a new thing. Not at all. Well, on the advice of Mordecai, her cousin, what she does through this whole competition, if you will, is she doesn't reveal the fact that she's Jewish. Instead, she holds that off for a very important time. Well, one day, Mordecai overhears a plot to assassinate the king, and he gets word to Esther that there's a plot afoot to take the king out. Esther tells the king, and the king has those two people that are planning to kill the king executed. The whole thing is recorded in the history books of the Persian Empire, just for posterity's sake. And about that time, there's a guy named Haman that comes into power. He's actually probably the second in command in in all of the empire, a good, close friend of, of the king. Well, Haman is pretty full of himself, and he's excited about the fact that as he walks by, because he's so important, almost everybody, almost everybody bows down and worships him. The only exception is Mordecai, Esther's cousin. He doesn't worship because he's a Jew. He doesn't bow down because he bows only to the one true God. And this really rattles and actually infuriates Haman, so much so that he gets the king to sign off on this crazy decree that not only Mordecai, but the entire Jewish population will be massacred on a certain day coming up in the future. This becomes, for Esther and Mordecai, their defining moment in their relationship and the defining moment, really, in the book. Mordecai says to Esther, listen, Esther, you have been appointed to your royal position for just this moment in history. It's up to you to go to the king and get the Jewish people saved. Here's what he says. He says to Esther, and who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Now what we need to understand is this is a huge request because the way the system was set up back then is you just don't show up in front of the king uninvited. Not even the queen does that. In fact, the rules were so strict that if you showed up, made an appearance before the king without his permission, what would happen is that you could be executed. The only exception would be if the king would raise his golden scepter and welcome you in. But Esther commits to this grander vision, to this bigger purpose. And she has this wonderful line to Mordecai. And she says, listen, have the people fast for me for three days. And I'm going to go in and talk to the king. And here's the deal. If I die, I die. 
That's risky. That's a big deal. And that's where we left off last week. Well, this is the part of the story where we begin to see the character of people emerge. We see character strengths and we see character flaws. And we're going to keep rolling on in the story of Esther. Esther courageously goes to visit the king unannounced and he doesn't have her executed. Now, that's a big deal. And she did it. Esther simply says, I want to invite you and Haman to a banquet that I want to prepare. That's her only request to the king. Here's what she says. If it pleases the king, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet that I have prepared for him. Now, the king and Haman anticipate that she's going to ask something at this party, this banquet that she's throwing. And so the king initiates, okay, what do you want, Esther? I give you anything. What do you want? She says, well, what I really want to do is I want to have you guys back tomorrow for another banquet. He agrees. He and Haman leave, and a banquet date is set for the very next day. Same three people. On the way home, Haman is just glowing. He's totally full of himself. He's flying high. He's got the height of arrogance. That's his character flaw. And as he's going home, he sees Mordecai, the one guy in the kingdom who will not bow down to him. Haman goes into a rage. He's super frustrated, flings the door of his house open. His wife is there and some of his buddies. He just goes off on a rant against Mordecai because Mordecai will not bow down before him. I want to read for you what Haman's wife and Haman's friends say to him. Listen to this out of Esther chapter five. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to Haman, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on the pole. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. <laughs> this suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. This was a gruesome time. This is what they did. This is what Haman wanted to do to Mordecai. So the next day, well, let me take you to the night before. It's a restless night for the king. He can't sleep. And so he gets up in the middle of the night. I don't know if you've ever had that situation arise in your life. He gets up in the middle of the night. He decides to do some reading. Well, the king is the king, and so actually he has people read to him. He brings in one of his servants. He says, hey, let's just crack open the history books and start reading about my empire, about the things that have happened during my reign. Well, the reader gets to the part in the history of the empire where Mordecai foiled this assassination attempt. The king says, oh, I remember that. Hey, did we do anything for Mordecai because he saved my life? The servant says, I don't think so. So, the next day, Haman arrives at the palace a little bit early in the morning, ready to ask the king to have Mordecai impaled on a stake. Before he can get that out, the king says, hey, Haman, can you help me brainstorm a little bit? I, I got this idea. I really want to honor someone in the kingdom. What would you do if you were me and wanted to give someone in my kingdom the highest honor? Now, here's the thing. Haman cannot think of anyone more deserving, anyone more earning of high praise and honor than himself. So he lays it on to the king. Here's what he says. Wow, here, here's what I'd do. I would get one of the royal robes, a robe that you have literally worn, and I'd put it over this person that you want to honor. Then I'd get one of the horses out of, out of the royal stable, a horse that you've literally ridden on, and I would put him on that horse. I'd put your royal crest on the horse as well. Then what I would do is I would take one of your most noble princes in the entire empire, and I would have that prince walk that hero through the streets proclaiming this is what the king does for people he delights in. That's what I would do, Mr. King. The king says, ah, Haman, that is brilliant. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to dress up Mordecai just like you said and parade him through the streets because I want to honor that guy. Can you imagine? Everything comes undone for Haman. So the Bible says Haman got the robe and the horse. 
he robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. (laughs) Talk about humiliating. This has got to be the worst day in Haman's life, except for what happens next, and that's in Esther chapter 7. Haman Haman drags himself after this humiliation. He drags himself to the banquet, to the queen's party, where the king asks Esther, okay, what's on your mind? I'm willing to give you anything, anything up to half of my kingdom. He just loved Esther. And Esther said, well, here's the thing. There's this vile, evil man in your kingdom, and he is planning to slaughter me and all of my people. You see, I'm Jewish, and me and all of my people are set up to be slaughtered, and here's the thing. If it were just slavery we were be sent into, I wouldn't have even bothered you about this, but but this is a massacre. This is genocide. This is what's gonna happen because of this evil, evil person. Well, the king, by this time, is absolutely raging. And he says, who is behind this horrible plot? She points to Haman and says, he is. Haman is the one that came up with this idea. Well, the king just explodes, and he storms out of the room as he's processing, trying to get his thoughts together. As he leaves, Haman falls all over Esther, begging for his life. The king comes back in and sees Haman basically on top of his wife and gets even more furious. And all of a sudden, a servant comes into the room and says this to the king. Hey, we just found out that there's this pole outside of Haman's house. It's 50 cubits high. And his plan was to impale Mordecai on that pole. Well, this gives the king a brilliant idea. Here's what the Bible says in Esther chapter 7. So they impaled Haman on the pole that he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Another decree is issued by the king, and the Jews are saved from the massacre. They're saved from genocide. This is an incredible story, isn't it? The ups and the downs, the twists and the turns, the suspense, the drama, it's absolutely incredible. And it's all in a book of the Bible that does not mention God. But at the same time, we see God's hand, we see God's plan, we see God's work and God's will moving in and out throughout the book of Esther time and time again. Now, I don't know about you, but at this time in our lives, at this time in our world and in our country, we need a book like Esther. We need Esther to say some things to us. It gives us hope to read a book like Esther, hope for the world that we live in, hope for the problems that we face today. Because today we're living in a world that's experiencing going through a global pandemic. We're living in in a world in a country where there's divisiveness between people and party. We're living in in a place of social unrest, of economic uncertainty. We're living in a time when we have to take a hard look at racial inequality and racial justice. These are hard and important, vital things to look at. And it's tempting to think that God is absent. It's tempting to think that God is nowhere to be found. But that's why we need to hear from Esther today. So if we were to meet up with Esther, what would she say to us? Because her story reminds us that God is present. Her story reminds us that God is at work in the world. So what would Esther say to us? I think the first thing that Esther would say is this, that people influence the direction of your life, so choose wisely. People influence the direction of your life. Choose wisely, that's what Esther would tell us. The hero, Esther, and the villain, Haman, in this story, both get advice. Did you notice that? They both get advice. Esther gets, would remind us that Mordecai's advice was challenging. It was difficult. She had to be courageous to take his advice. She, he was calling her to a higher level of purpose. Mordecai challenged 
Esther to a higher calling and a greater purpose. That's what Mordecai did. It was a hard word from a wise advisor. Haman's advisors did nothing more than fuel his arrogance. People influence the direction of your life. You know this. Look at. Think about a time in your life when you blew it. Think about a time in your life when you, when you did something that you regret, when you got caught, when you got in trouble. I'll bet if you think about that time, you were either influenced or with some people when that thing happened. That's the way it goes. People influence the direction of our lives, even our mistakes. Think of something that you did that was great. Something good, something successful, an achievement that you had in your life. I'll bet you can trace it back to people in your life who either helped you or inspired you to get to that place. People will influence the direction of your life. That's what Esther would remind us. Proverbs tells us that too. Here's what Proverbs 13.20 says. Walk with the wise and become wise. A companion of fools suffers harm. When you walk with the wise, you become wise. When you're a companion of fools, man, you go down the wrong road. <laughs> when our kids were growing up, when they hit about middle school, we have three kids, every one of them, I, I said this to them when they were in middle school, and I hope it stuck with them. I'll have to ask them later on this week. Here's what I told them. I said, you guys, here's the deal. People are like elevator buttons. They'll take you up or they'll take you down. Walk with the wise and become wise. A companion of fools suffers harm. People influence the direction of your life. Esther would tell us that. The second thing I think Esther would say to us is this. God often works behind the scenes. God works behind the scenes. She'd tell us that her greatest moments were not because of what she did, but because of who she trusted. You see, God was at work behind the scenes. And the twists and the turns, the ups and the downs, the, the uniqueness of her story is amazing, but Esther knew that God was at work behind the scenes. So her greatest moments were not because of what she did, but because of who she trusted. Julie and I have been watching TV at home. What else do you do, right, during shelter in place, during... COVID-19, during all the, the clampdown and quarantines that we've experienced. So we've been enjoying some shows, and one of the things we did last week is we watched Hamilton. What a great Broadway play. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen it, and if not, I'd highly recommend it. It is awesome. Uh, we love musical theater, and I've seen a lot of plays through the years. And one thing that struck me at the end of Hamilton, I started thinking about this, it, it's true at the end of every play, really. What happens is that the, the whole cast comes out and they take a bow and everyone claps and it's, it's wonderful. Then the lead character, whoever that is, goes to the edge of the stage and what does he do? He points down at the conductor. And for the first time in the whole play, the spotlight goes on the conductor and he turns around and he acknowledges the orchestra and he takes a bow. It's the conductor, why does he do that? Why does the actor do that? It isn't it enough just to be acknowledged for what they've done? They've done a great performance. No, it's the conductor who creates the mood. It's the conductor that creates the rhythm and the cadence and the pace and the story. It's all about the conductor and how they move that story along. But nobody sees the conductor until the star points him out. This is an unprecedented time in the world. And it's a rapidly changing time in the church, too. So much is happening, and so fast. But God is the conductor of it all. And we need to anchor down in that truth. God is the conductor, and God is at work behind the scenes. He's creating moon and rhythm and pace and story. We're gonna be able to tell and express that story in wonderful ways, as long as we remember that God is the one who's conducting it all. Finally, I think Esther would say this to us. You risk most for what matters most. She'd tell us that. And you know that's true. You know that's true in your life. You risk most for what matters most. 
You risked when you said I love you to your spouse for the very first time. <laughs> that was a risk. Remember that? You risked when you took on extra financial burden because you love your kids so much you wanted to help them through their education. You risked when you confronted a friend who had an addiction and you wanted to help them. So you took that risk. You risked when you started a conversation or sat down for lunch with someone who no one pays much attention to because they're awkward or they're different. We risk most for what matters most. And what matters most to God is people. Esther would say, what people is God putting on your heart? What people is God putting in your path that you need to take a risk for? I said this last week, Esther is the forerunner of Jesus. And this is where we see it, I think, most clearly. God's great risk, if you will, God's big move in history was in fleshing himself in the person of Jesus Christ. It was the incarnation, God coming to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And the reason God did that was because people mattered so much to God. The religious people of Jesus' day just couldn't wrap their minds around this truth. They, they couldn't come to grips with the fact that, that God cared so much that he would come in person. Over and over again, they tripped over that truth. They just couldn't make it work in their heads that God would care so much to come as a person. Well, there's a story in John chapter 3 where a guy named Nicodemus, who's a, a religious leader, comes to Jesus. He's a little bit afraid of his buddies finding out, so he actually comes to Jesus at night, and he's just, his mind is bending over backwards to try to figure out who this Jesus is. They, they have this conversation, you remember it, probably in John chapter 3, and at one point in the conversation, Jesus says to Nicodemus, look, here's the deal. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would never die but, but have eternal life. Nicodemus, I'm here because people matter that much to God. Well, here's the thing. Those of us who follow Jesus have to follow his lead. We need to enflesh ourselves in the world. We need to enflesh ourselves and the love of God in other people's lives. That's what we do as believers. We show up and we take risks for people because God loves people that much, because people matter to God. So, who is it for you? Who's the person? Who are the people that God wants you to risk for? If Esther were here today as the forerunner, if Jesus were here today as the fulfiller, <laughs> they would team up as one voice and they would say this to us, you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Let's pray about that. God, we thank you for the story of Esther. We thank you that the story didn't end with her, but it continued all the way through history and fulfilled itself in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you that people matter to you that much, and so they ought to matter to us too. Jesus, we thank you for giving your life to us, for enfleshing yourself so that the world could know you and know the depth of your love for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us see your hand, your work in the world today. It's a challenging time, it's a messy place, but you are at work in the same way that you were working all the circumstances in Esther's world. You're at work today. You're the conductor. Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to surround ourselves with wise and godly people, 